is? Well, I think it's just every, everyone measures um, their expectations against, yeah, historically, everyone's measured against kind of past experiences, and that's kind of what's set there, you know, their, their expectation for anything that they do. And I think what's, what's changed is not only are those expectations moving very quickly, right, today, but also you have access to the kind of the hive, right? You have what everyone else is saying about you know, their own expectations, their own experiences. So suddenly your expectations are not just set by your own experiences. They're set by, you know, the best experiences that some person you've never met has had, right? And so kind of as, as a result of that, you know, I think you have this kind of trend towards, you know, not necessarily, it's not just immediacy, it's just kind of the best, right? You expect everything you know, quicker, but you also expect it to be better and you expect it to be cheaper. Um, and I think that's, and, and I think that kind of um, is above culture, right? Because, you know, ev everything is now, is, is, is now global. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I think, Carlos, when, when we're talking about this expectation of things to be better, the thing that I thought was the best about your presentation was, was people talking about a service that sells itself. You mentioned Square and the taxi driver talking about how this works. How do you think you can design products or build services that, that sell themselves through word of mouth in, in this day and age? Um, so going back to the, the point that Izzy made about lean methodologies, I mean, I'm assuming most of you have read The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. How many of you have heard of that book? So it's, it's a pretty much now the de facto book um, to read before you start a startup. And really it's about getting early customer validation and understanding that, that pain. And then that usually at least gets you in the right path that you're going after something meaningful. Um, for example, some of the examples of, of, of um, uh, collaborative consumption are sometimes around markets that had to develop over time. Right. So we have two investments, um, which, one which we sold this year, called RentMine Online. We sold it to a company called RealPage. <coughs> RentMine Online was an example of collaborative consumption, um, uh, but it started in 2007, which was before everyone got their mind around that concept. And so they, are, they were like the first ones to come up with this idea of like, here, here's a boat, you know, or here's a, a, a screwdriver or something. Everything that you're seeing right now, they were trying to do. But they ran into a problem that nobody was used to that model. Like nobody was willing to loan their stuff out. Whereas I think there's been a, a cultural change now, and one of our investments, Milkly, which is the European version of TaskRabbit, does facilitate that. So then all of a sudden it's a product that everyone wants, right? But even in those sub-segments, you have stuff like luxury boat collaborative consumption. Jets up, now. Huh? Yeah. Uber's doing jets as well. Yeah, but like, you know, one of the funny things about you have to pick the pain of the customer. Turns out that the people who own luxury, rock, luxury yachts don't care about renting out their spare space because, well, it's more of a hassle for them than the money they have they're going to get back. So, again, it's matching matching what the customer wants rather than, than building something specifically and then seeing, you know, and hoping you got it right. Sure, sure. So I'd like to open up to the audience. Anyone have any specific <coughs> questions for our three wise men on trends? Some of those startups seem to have uh, a very, very, very small niche requirement, like the dog sitting service. Like if you want to have your dog staying in a nice house overnight, you can call a friend or a kennel. So I think the market segment for that is really small. But are those things, do those kind of ideas have feasibility now because the internet is so big. Because you can get 100% penetration. Right? Before, you would have never had any ability, you know, <coughs> ability to get even like single digit penetration in a single country. Right? But now you can, you, can, you can make a business like that go global. I, mean, I, I agree. I, sorry, sorry. No, I, I guess the only point I was going to make about that is that you're, you're assuming one thing, which is you're assuming that it's the current size of the market as defined by current cons proxy uh, numbers, meaning people that are willing to, let's say, buy a dog, and that's the total market size. Um, this is kind of maybe an overused term, but the blue ocean strategy, which is anything that expands a market. And what we're finding right now with these kinds of products and startups is that there's a whole, like, that's actually bigger than you think. It's actually not a niche. It's changing the way people, like, would, if you had the ability to, for example, to borrow a, 
uh, specific items that you would never be able to afford, is that going to change the way that you now think about doing an activity that you otherwise would never do? Maybe canoeing now is something you would actually consider doing on the weekends because you don't have to store the damn canoe, right? And so the consumption market for canoe goods is going to go up a lot. So I think some of these players have taken bets on that. I'll just take a, take a pun on that. Like, I, I want to consolidate these two points. One, there's two to three billion people with access to the Internet. And that number is growing rapidly. And if we talk about mobile activations, you know, it's, uh, it's close. To, like, the, the numbers are staggering. Even just Android activations in a day, uh, the numbers are incredible. So I think that market, what you see now, is actually, you know, rapidly growing. And the other thing um, is that, you know, maybe that we're picking on the dog idea, uh, which actually got funded by very smart people, so they must have seen exponential growth there. Uh, but look at Airbnb. You know, like Airbnb. Are you familiar with Airbnb? No. Airbnb. I'm about Disney, so like. Yeah. <laughs> Airbnb is a, is a startup that's maybe like three years old. Um, they started in Y Combinator, which is the world's uh, most I guess. Well, yeah. sorry. It's, no. the, it's the second place uh, accelerator. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a small accelerator in the valley. Um, and this startup, basically, very shortly after Y Combinator, got a billion dollar valuation. So there's a lot of hype in that. But they unlocked potential. And I think this is the, this is the key of uh, collaborative consumption. Regular people that have apartments and they were going traveling were used to putting those apartments on maybe Craigslist and, you know, or Gumtree where it was anonymized and you know, not a very efficient marketplace. And suddenly you have thousands of people around the world that can actually make more money subletting their apartment on Airbnb rather than renting it to tenants. And so I know several people that do that in London, in Tel Aviv and some other places. So this is a company that's now much more than a billion dollar valuation. Peter Thiel is about to invest 150 million in them. And it's the same idea of a marketplace. Rather than doing kennels or you know, dog sitting, they do apartments. So I think that you can keep playing with the model and finding that niche that has lots of demand or suddenly the market is ready for and, and the potential is immense. Uh, do you think for startups who um, think they <clears throat> have a good innovative product or service and they're, let's say, based in the UK and they have English language as their you know, main, <coughs> you know, what you see on the screen is all in English and everything, um, there are a lot of copycat companies that copy <coughs> into uh, digital companies because it's quite easy to do um, and, and they open that in their market in those specific languages. Do you think it's... Uh, in order to prevent the copying from happening, one should try to invest in all these different language platforms from the start, or um, you know, s for some kind of companies that's quite important that the, I mean, a lot of people have the internet but can't speak English you know, around the world. I can give you my opinion, and then these two guys are probably more qualified to answer this question, but I just um, heard someone talking about it yesterday, so it's very fresh in my mind. It's a company called Lingo24, and they do crowdsource translations into uh, a bunch of languages for very cheap. I think that UK startups in general need to start thinking global from day one. Like in Israel, that's a must because there's a very small, if not non-existent, uh, domestic market. And in the UK, we get to, we tend to get tempted by a relatively strong market with people with income that are willing to spend online. So they don't necessarily think uh, immediately about Brazil, Russia, China, etc. Of course. As an early stage startup, you're going to have competition, but I think this is where the element of speed comes in. You know, like start with a very small, uh, minimum viable product, test the concept, validate it, and then if the concept has been validated with users actually purchasing the service or adopting whatever it is that, that you're offering, and you have to see if it works in other places and be very, very fast. So it's unavoidable or inevitable that you're going to have competition and copycats. The question is, you know, what you can ch you can change what other people do. You can change only what you do, and how quickly you approach those markets. But really, you yeah, guys. I are think the and this got, this got, this copycats have all come about because the U.S. businesses haven't moved fast enough because they've said, <coughs> "Hey, our market is kind of big enough. We can just focus on here." Right. So in some ways, there's a kind of there's an advantage to being a um, to being a, a non non U.S. startup. But you know, we're we're moving to the U.S. now very quickly because. We're starting to get um, copycats over there. We've been doing what we've been doing in the UK for two and a bit years. Right? We have 
thousands of couriers on the ground in dozens of cities in the UK doing tens of thousands of transactions every day. But we've got startups in San Francisco that are tiny, right, in terms of scale, but have got you know, a few dozen couriers in a single small city, right, who are getting mind share of our, you know, of our, of our space. And so we now have to go over there to actually say the model that we've got is actually the scalable one here. And to give you an idea of kind of the scale differential between UK and the US, right? So our model relies on um, short distance deliveries, which <coughs> means having high population density. Right? In the UK, we can get quite a high population density. Right? So we can get penetration of about, currently we've got about 75% of the population. We may be able to get up to 85, possibly even 90%. We'll never do that in the US, but we don't need to, right? So we're in, 40, 48 cities or something in the UK, 75% um, of 60 million people. We're, our addressable market here is about 45 million. The first 12 cities we're launching in North America have got a total population of 90 million, right? And then, yeah, there's another scale above that. Um, Sao Paulo in Brazil has got four times more same-day couriers than the UK has, right? This is what one city, the world's largest same-day courier market. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's all about moving, moving quickly. I, I just said that too many people are building products for um, <coughs> white males 24 to 35 in San Francisco. Like, we have to start thinking about <laughs> <Yeah>. the rest <laughs> of the world. <laughs> yeah. There's another question. No, I was, um, I know an early start-off such as the dog one, which sounds very interesting, but how would you value an early start-off such as that? which has got no revenue coming in, or maybe then... Ask the VC. <laughs> Whatever anyone's willing to pay. Get some competitive the attention. The long answer the short answer? answer. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually called it Friday.com, which is all about events and venues. It's very early stage. But it's, when you talk about valuation of something, how do you actually value something when it's only just start up? So it's, it's <coughs> how do you look at that? Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a question we get asked often. Um, yeah. Uh, he pitched his blocks, I'm going to pitch mine. Um, <laughs> the drawingboard.me, the drawingboard.me, I, I, I give a longer explanation, but in summary, the markets determine the price that a company is willing to be bought out by a, let's say, corporate. Therefore, that sets the maximum price. As an investor, you can backtrack into what price you have to enter in to make the return you expect. You then compare that to all the other companies that are relatively priced, relative to your peers, so that you are basically going to put a bid as a term sheet, and you don't want to lose the deal to other VCs who might be putting in a term sheet at that market price. So it's a combination of exit, total exit potential for your company based on previous transactions, and what the current market is for uh, companies in your space and in your funding stage. And then it also it's a function of how much money you're asking. Because another way of thinking about this is if you're raising five million on a company that has basically nothing going for it in terms of like uh, customers or revenues or anything like that, if you price it cheap, you're gonna basically own the company. So you have to have this highly inflated valuation in order to compensate so that you don't basically steal the company from the founders. So there's a there's an equation there, there's a um, a ratio of money you're raising relative to how much percentage ownership a, a investor is going to take. And usually an investor, a VC investor, does not want to take 50% ownership of your company. And then there's competitive tension. And there's competitive tension, which a, a sort of more of the standard deviation around the market <coughs> norm. So I don't know if I got too geeky on that one. But. <coughs> Can I ask, in, in terms of valuation and real cash, you know, these types of businesses, they don't need that much cash, do they? It's like a million, it's like a shed load of of website development, which predominantly paying salaries and, and web development is, is the principal cost. So it depends on what you're talking about in cash needs, right? Because there's two components to cash needs. There's the first one, which is development, team expansion, office, all that kind of stuff. I agree with that. The, the beauty of the day we're living in today is that That's it takes cheap. very little to start. I mean, Seed Camp gives 50,000 euros, a bunch of guys, three guys, four guys, and they can make it run for like six months. So it's, 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 it's incredibly lean. But when you look at, let's take any of these marketplaces, Marketplaces require quite a bit of acceleration in terms of a marketing perspective, and you can probably 
comment on you know what Salesforce does in terms of expansion and as well for you you know like there's some serious amount of money that needs to be pumped into that from a pers from a customer acquisition point of view even if you have a high virality coefficients you're still going to have to put a lot of money into marketing when it comes to e-commerce I would say that uh, the cost per the whole game is having a lifetime value of a customer meaning how much money you can extract from a customer that's much higher than the mm. cost per acquisition of that customer so you're spending money to get a customer using ads or uh, whatever maybe like offline campaigns and then you're extracting money from transactions so with this collaborative consumption startups one of the beauties and I think that in that point you're right they need less cash because a lot of this uh, cost per acquisition gets reduced because of the the viral or the social distribution yes. however to get it kick-started and you probably saw it with the, co the company you guys sold uh, rent nine online to get it kick-started, especially in a market that doesn't have the culture, or, you know, it's not used to this model, um, you need to, to spend. And sometimes it's, it's a lot about experience. <coughs> you can spend thousands of pounds on advertising, but it's like pouring water to a bucket with a giant hole in it. You know, like if you're not able to capture these transactions and convert these users into buyers, it's very hard to, to make money. So, yeah, it de the, the answer is it depends. Is, is that the battle then? Is about the because, you know, there's no IP in this. It's about getting to market first. So the, 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 the issue is about raising as much money to compete yeah, with the it, advertising spend to, to dominate the space. In any marketplace, the key is liquidity, right? Um, and liquidity doesn't, doesn't, doesn't come cheap. Right? I actually disagree with that uh, comment on the more you, the more you raise, the more... Uh, success chances you have because look at look at Instagram for example you know like color was an app that uh, didn't have a product that raised 40 million dollars from Sequoia and pretty much you know failed to launch uh, now it was bought by Apple the rumors are it was bought by Apple but it's a it's a failure in, in you know in, in terms of startups and then you have a startup that can be very lean but just has a great ex execution with great traction uh, because of this social adoption so I don't think that there's a direct correlation between you know deep pockets and success chances, but it definitely helps in the marketing efforts. There's, there's another thing that it helps you with. It's also I have yet to see a single startup, especially at the earlier stage, that doesn't commit mistakes. And what that extra cash buys you is room for mistakes. It's room for mistakes in terms of hiring, in terms of go-to-market strategies, in terms of anything. It's also it's also an analog for a business that has been successful in some way in that it's been able to convince you know, people to invest, right? And, and usually, you know, most, most startups are following the methodology. When we, when we started, you know, we, were, we put in 50K initially, which we used to build a minimum viable product to get it in front of a customer, to get a cust big customer to say yes, to figure out the dynamics of the business before we raised any, you know, any, 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 any serious funding. Um, and so, you know, if you've gone through that process and convinced you know, real investors that what you're doing has a, um, yeah, has a return, then that's kind of in some ways an analog for, um, for success. So I don't think it's... No, well, it wasn't that the days when, you know, you earned your IP and you could sustain your IP, but nowadays it's not like that anymore, is it? From what I understand, what I, what I glean that... It depends what you're doing. Uh, it depends. I mean... <coughs> Software patents are a little bit like uh, nuclear weapons, you know, like everyone wants to have them, no one wants to use them. Um, so for an early stage startup, they can protect their IP. They can, it would cost them $50,000 to write a patent in the US. It would take a couple of years for, you know, the patent to get done completely. So they don't, they don't bother, uh, but some do, like, you know, in the payment space, uh, in the telecommunication space, you know, it's very important and actually that would, act, that would have significant impact on your valuation. It's uh, not really the cost of getting the patent, right? Because getting a patent isn't very expensive. The problem with the startup is even if you get a patent, you don't have the ability to either litigate, prosecute yeah. or defend, right? Because you don't have the millions, tens of millions of dollars you need. But it's useful to an acquirer. Yeah, right? that's, that was the point I was going to make, is that if, if Qualcomm's going to be your acquirer, yeah. having that patent's going to make you that much more attractive. If it's a marketplace that's buying you, <laughs> It's your execution, most likely. Yeah. It really bugs me how people equate patents with IP. There's the brand, there's copyright, there's all sorts of other IP, especially with the brand. If you want to license people, you've got a solution. 
you know, to we're stop talking here mainly copyright. about technology businesses. And but the technology, even technology businesses, businesses can, the copyright is a huge aspect of it. If they Copy, copyright of code is is pretty much irrelevant because you can code something a million different ways. So copyright has zero value in a technology business. Right? Copyright has lots of value if you're a content business. Um, for a technology business, you know, patents can be useful. Con but licensing. Like content businesses, you know, like if you're producing, um, there's a company called Demand Media, a very successful company, mm -hmm. and what they do is they have a combination of technology and content. So they have a way of knowing what's going to be trendy tomorrow in terms of, let's say, searches, and then they go and produce original video content using crowdsourcing technology, and, and they create these videos. So in their case, their IP is also their content, and they would care about how their content gets used, shared, etc. But I agree with Tom. Uh, that's, you know, that, that's a minority. There's very few businesses that make their new businesses that make their uh, business model based on content. It's actually the old businesses, you know, like record labels, TV stations that are clinging into this content as IP, and they're suffering because everyone, you know, everyone shares it on the internet for and free. Or can make it. <laughs> yeah. What about the brand, though? I mean, that's often brand is goodwill. I don't see it as IP. Brand is a goodwill that you create um, by providing a great experience for the user. So, uh, yeah, I I don't I don't see it as you know. It's very hard for a new startup to create a brand very early on that would be worth something in the valuation. It happens. Maybe with Instagram, you know, it played a big role, but it's very hard to do it. And, and Brian, Brian was particularly useful, I mean, from a, from a kind of a trademark perspective, right? Remember, that's the kind of what, is it what you had up on the kind of 20th century, right? When, when people were consuming, um, you know, content that was being sent to them. Right when it was buy Coca Cola or whatever. Right today, that's not how people are absorbing. Right, they, you know, it's not just the big brands. You know, anyone can create content and yeah. can get to their audience. So it's it's, it's much in, less. Of as a result, you have a lot of mediocre content <laughs> as well. Which yeah. is but, but, it's, it's a big it's a big bigger market too. Right, so people that are creating great content are always going to find their audience. You know. You're, Fox News may have a bigger audience. But. There's a great book, uh, well, it's not great, actually. There's a, a book, mediocre book. There's a mediocre book called <laughs> The Long Tail. You can actually read the blog post in a five-page PDF, and you get it. But it says that, you know, we used to, kind of like 20th century was the blockbusters, and, and like these are the you know, like few movies that made all the money, or the few records, you know, Michael Jackson that had all the sales. But now, with you know, e-commerce and the internet and like Amazon, for example, where you can have like infinite stock and you're not, you're not uh, sacrificing space on the shelf. If you combine all those long tail, you know, niche publications, you know, mediocre books, movies, uh, <laughs> records, etc., in aggregate, it's much bigger than the head. So um, this is not about this is not about creating that multi-million, you know, brand, creating the next Coca-Cola or the next Google or Facebook, which is the aspiration of a lot of companies, that's going to be very hard. But if you're able to carve a big enough niche or multiple niches, um, you can create a lot of value. And someone will buy you and, you know. So I think you have time for one last question. Yeah. Um, can you talk to us about um, trends in raising f uh, you know, decent amounts of um, finance by crowdfunding? Um, so I'm trying to raise about 20 million pounds. Um, and I want to, you know, get a sense of, you know, obviously there's the Kickstarters of the world, but I, I think my impression of that is it's a fairly small sum of money, but there have been a couple of big successes, you know, into the millions. But we raised two million on um, AngelList, but we had applications for six million. Um, so, and that was in about two weeks. Wow. So, um, how much about what you guys have done was on there, though? Sorry? How much, how much of your track record yeah, it, but, but what we've done is we've raised small amounts incrementally, right? So from that first 50k, we had improved a bunch of stuff, then we were able to get a you know, higher valuation, raise more money, go prove a bunch of different stuff, right? And do that you know, each bit. So that by the time we did, you know, we did that round, um, you know, we'd already we'd have already had two years of proof points. And well, I mean, I guess one one point that I was trying to make as well is who you are. Yeah. Like I think you're discounting that a bit. 
Yeah, so I'd, I'd, had a, I'd had a business in the space. But in, in terms of, yeah, I think you're playing it down Sorry. a bit. <laughs> 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 I, I, you know, it's like getting money in platforms like that when you have a track record and yeah. you have people that know you makes a huge difference, mm -hmm. right? Because otherwise raising, I mean, even raising a huge amount like that in AngelList is not normal. Mm -hmm. um, whereas like 20 million, now we're talking serious money. I mean, that's even beyond the scope of typical A rounds. I mean, we're talking so severe amounts. I mean, what's huh? the business? Um, I've, I've sorry, got to invest it. I've basically got, um, got a massive collection of Concorde aircraft items that I'm um, bringing to life. The supersonic story uh, through a sort of innovation center, if you like, and looking at future transport um, technology and trends. Um, so the, the, there's more sort of, I guess, a physical housing of, of everything. So. It, so the, so mon the money the, the money is being used for basically rent and for inventory. Uh, yes. Right. Yeah. So I, I guess the, maybe what I would push back on is do you need all of it up front or can you have a subset of it to validate whether or not anybody actually cares about this um, before you try to raise 20 million to return something that has yet to materialize into a marketplace. That's the long term vision, yeah. I right. guess shorter term is the two million and then that will go well, into the smallest if, if, amount if, you possibly can to prove as much yeah. as you possibly yeah. can. Yeah. Two million is definitely a lot I mean yeah. it's still a lot, but yeah. I would say V C is not necessarily, you know, the only option or the right option. VCs are looking for exponential returns. <clears throat> what you're describing sounds like a you know museum slash visitor center sort of business where you're going to have ticket sales and there's going to be maybe, you know, hopefully, like nice linear growth, but there's not going to be exponential returns. The reason that VCs invest in technology business or uh, businesses or um, some other businesses where you can unlock this like massive growth that it's not going to be like 500 more visitors next week. I'm talking about, you know, a million more users every week. And so I wouldn't look at financing necessarily as venture capital financing, here, you know, it sounds like you can even go to a bank and say, like, I want a loan against these assets that are going to sit on a balance sheet and they are sellable, and um, you know, I will pay the loan over 20 years in these installments, and I expect to see this cash flow. You know, it sounds like something you can do with a bank or a private equity fund, but I wouldn't go to VC because it's just not right for them. I mean, if you wanted to get really creative, you could create, you could have personal people that are particularly interested in the space, you create something like a convertible note that you you set the terms on this and then you pay it back like a, a like a debt product. Mm -hmm. But if it takes off you can either they choose to either convert to equity or you pay them back as if it were interest bearing loan. Mm -hmm. And so you make them effectively loan holders. That's another kind That's of a great idea. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, I feel there's lots of questions still brewing in the room, but we'll save those for drinks. Thank you, Xavier. Thank you very much for the keynote. And now we have drinks in the back. Coming up, we also.